With Hashem's loving grace, this is Laser Brody from the Chut Chesed Yeshiva in the Holy City of Yerushalayim with another one of our Amuna series lessons based on the teachings of our esteemed and beloved rabbi and spiritual guide, Rabbi Shalom Arush. May Hashem bless him always. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be gratifying to Hashem. And may everyone that hears today's lesson get a lot of encouragement and spiritual strengthening. We have a very special lesson today. Before we start, I want to make a dedication. Today's shiur and broadcast is dedicated for the Neshama Lilui Nishmat Chaim Rafael Ben Yitzchak. He's the precious father of Shlomit, Chana Yitzchak, and Tuvia, and the dear and precious husband of Masha Devora, and grandfather of Batya Yenta, Netanya Shora, Yichai, and Zelda. May his Neshama be bound up in the bond of eternal life, and may everyone that gets strengthened from this shiur it be to the credit of Chaim Rafael Ben Yitzchak. Uh, for those who've been asking, anyone that wants to make a dedication of Tishur for a loved one, or they have a particular title for the Shur, they have subject that they want us to speak about, particularly interesting, what they could do is they could get a hold of Rabbi Aaron Dubinsky, and the way you get a hold of him is very easy. You send an email to staff, S-T-A-F-F, at breslev.co.il. That's B-R-E-S-L-E-V dot C-O dot I-L. Once again, Breslev, like staff at breslev.co.il. The Rabbi Aaron, and uh, you can arrange that with him. We have a very special and important lesson today that many people have been asking us to talk about, and it's something that is not so simple, but it's a basic tenet in, Jew in Judaism. Not only do people that are newcomers to Judaism, new Balchuvas ask it, people that have been born into Judaism, they say, how do we know there's life after death? Do Jews believe in life after death? So today's lesson, we're going to address three particular topics, three important topics. Okay, and I want to explain, first of all, that most of the source material based on today's lesson, it comes from Geshe Chaim. Geshe Chaim is a three-volume book. It was written by a big tzaddik at Bnei Brak, and Yechiel Michal Tochachinsky. Uh, I was close with his grandson, Rabbi Shmuel Tolachinsky. He's the one that taught me Shrita, Bo Hashem. But this a monumental book, when you want to know, when you want to learn what happens to the Neshama, he brings a compendium of everything that's in the Gemara, everything that's in the Zohar, <clears throat> everything that's in, our, in the Torah and the Nevi'im, all about the Neshama, what happens to the Neshama. So people say, how do you know does it, what happens to the Neshama? And people say facetious, facetiously or cynically, they say, oh, does anybody ever come back? Yes, plenty of people have come back. Now there's evidence all over the world. Look at the net. If you go into the net, which I don't suggest you do, I suggest you learn Torah, but if you're in the net anyway, and you Google NDE, near death experience, and you will get all types of testimony from people all over the world, not only Jews, Japanese and Eskimos and, and Bolivians, and Americans, the native, native South Americans, native North Americans, people that have had clinical death and experienced clinical death, and they all say the same thing. They all experience the same, we're talking about that. So our question number one, is there life after death? And how do we know it? Question number two, is the NDE, the near death experience, is it a real deal? Or is it somebody just dreaming up dreams? Question number three we're going to answer, Bezat Hashem, we've got some ground to cover today, is what happens to the neshama, what happens to the soul when it leaves the body? Okay, what do we have to look forward to? Okay, Bo Hashem. So with Hashem's help, Siata uh, Deshmaya, we hope to answer these questions, Bo Hashem. Question number one, does Judaism believe in life after death? It sure does. It sure does. When we say our 13 principles of the Rambam, we all, most of the time, we talk about the first principle here, where everything comes from Hashem. He alone does, does, and will do. The 11th principle of Imuna, the 11th principle is Anima I believe with a full and complete belief. That the Creator, blessed be His name, gives reward to those who do His will and punishes those that transgress his will. Well, the Rambam 
He derived everything from the Gemara. He boiled down the Gemara, everything in the Gemara, and made it to our 13 principles of Muna. What well, seems like, okay, Hashem says, Rabbah says, the 11th principle of Muna is reward and punishment. When is the reward and punishment? Comes along the Gemara, and the Gemara says, Schar mitzvah, Baha'i al malaika. The Gemara says there is no reward for mitzvahs in this world. So if the Gemara says, not only that, we open the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Zohar says the same thing. Schal mitzvah b'chai al malaika. That the reward for a mitzvah, there's no reward for a mitzvah. Why is there no reward for a mitzvah in this world? Mitzvahs defy all the money in the Swiss banks and all the oil in the Arabian oil fields and all the diamonds in the South America diamonds. <laughs> there's nothing to pay for. There's nothing to pay for. If we know, just take example, a mitzvah that most men take for granted, and they do it road, mitzvah anashim malumada, road, without kavana. Every day they put on tefillin. You put on tefillin? Yeah, you put on tefillin this morning. You put on tefillin? Yeah, you put on tefillin this morning. Who thought twice about putting on tefillin? You ever stop and think, what would happen a day went by and I didn't put on tefillin? How I would feel? You have to feel so good? What well, comes along the four highest angels, the archangels. We say, we mention them every time we go to sleep. We say, Mi mini Michael, from right Michael, Mi smali Gavriel, Michael Gavriel, in front of me, Oriel, behind me, Raphael. These are the four archangels. Angels that they accompany a person from all four directions. The Midrash tells us that any one of these four angels would willingly give up his lofty station. You know what it means? basking in divine light, serving a sham right in front of the heavenly throne, that they privileged, they were allowed to come so close to Hashem's light, so close to Hashem? No. Any one of them would come down in the world, would be willing to accept a flesh and blood body. There's no bigger jail than a flesh and blood body because it incarcerates the soul. The soul cannot see divine light once it's in the body. So how does the soul have its contact with divine light? needs the antenna of a called a muna. That's the soul's connection with divine light is through a muna and through the mitzvah. The muna is the first mitzvah of the 613. And by come all the other mitzvahs. So you take one mitzvah, it's not even the first mitzvah, mitzvah muna, mitzvah tefillin, that any archangel would give up his entire station to come down here for one time, not for a lifetime, one time to put on tefillin. That's the importance of tefillin. So if this is what it's worth, have no idea, cannot fathom. Let's put on one time tefillin. How many times do you put on tefillin in your life? But with the same thing, you could say for a woman that lights Shabbos candles. How many times do you light Shabbos candles? There is no reward in the entire, no zillions and trillions and quadrillions of dollars in the entire material world that could pay for one Shabbos of lighting Shabbos candles. Lighting Shabbos candles, it brings the divine presence to you. There's no, no, no reward for that. No reward for that. So what the Rambam is talking about, not that there's reward and punishment in this world, because there is no reward and punishment in this world. He's talking about the reward and punishment in the next world. It's right here the Rambam said that what we are striving for is the next world. This world is a way station. And it's very simple. It's very simple. All through the body is here for 80, 90, 100 years, and then it decomposes, it goes back into the ground, we'll talk about this in a moment, the body recomposes, it decomposes, and it turns back into the elements, the bones, they have calcium, they go back into the ground, person's muscles, they degenerate into nitrogen, become fertilizer in the ground, the potassium in a person's body goes back into the ground, decomposes. So the body goes back where its source is, okay, dust to dust, who, what Eob said, what Job said, dust to dust. And the neshama goes back to its source. And its source is Hashem, because the neshama comes from under the heavenly throne. This we don't understand the Shem, we don't even understand our neshamot, because our neshamot, what Rabbi Shem Bayer's high says in the Zohar, chelek elok me ma'al. They are a tiny part of godliness. This explains, you have to love every Jew as you love yourself, because you don't look at the body, you look at the neshama. The person is not the body, is the neshama. And I'll prove to you very simply that the person is not the body. When you say first person singular, when you say I or me, 
Who are you talking about? You're not talking about your digestive system. You don't tell your digestive system what to do. You go to sleep at night and you're out like a light. You're unconscious. Your digestive system is working. It's breaking down food. It's putting nutrients in your blood and putting waste out the other end. You're not doing anything. Are you telling your lungs, breathe lungs, inhale, exhale, okay? What are you, a private trainer? You're telling your lungs when to inhale and exhale? You don't tell your lungs anything. You do it automatically. And think when you're sleeping. You tell your brain what to do when you're sleeping. Your brain goes, and how many times people, what, what do people, people are running for analysts because they've got all kinds of thoughts in their brain. They don't even control their own thought process. If people could control their own thought process, and you say, yes, beloved brother, beloved sister, think positively, think nice things. Okay, nobody would need psychiatrists, psychologists. Okay, they don't have control of your brain. So you see, your body you have no control of. So the body is not you. Plus is the body that comes from the ground and it goes back into the ground. And this is what you're here for? Really you have to have compassion and pity for people that don't believe in life after death because they have a bleak life. What do you hear? Every day in your life, is more depression because every day in your life is one day closer to your funeral. It's one day closer to your body being decomposed, becoming dinner to the worms. Okay, and you, the great thing to do, a, 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 your, your great turnaround in life, and then you end up being fertilizer. Exact NPK, the exact elements that are in fertilizer, that's all a human body is once it decomposes. There's nothing in fertilizer that the human, human body has, does, doesn't have a thing that fertilizer doesn't have. So this is what it's all about. Just imagine, you take a bucket of water and you do the splash test. You know what the splash test is? To show what a human is. Put your hand in the bucket of water and shake it, splash, go, go crazy, splash water. Now take your hand out of the bucket of water and open it your stopwatch. If it's a 10 gallon, a 10 liter bucket of water, two and a half gallon bucket of water, it will take 22 seconds to the water is still like the hand was never there. So this is what people hear and they come, they advertise themselves, they make a big tumult and lots of noise and lots of waves to leave the world and that's it, and no purpose. We have a life of no purpose. This is what the people who believe that the life is a material life, they don't believe in life after life. They have no explanation for life. So you ask these people, would you raise your hand up and down? Would you do something, walk up the stairs, come down the stairs? You, you don't do anything with a purpose. Why would the creator do something without a purpose? Okay, so what are we doing here? We're doing it, the whole thing, the reason we're doing it, this is life after death. Hashem puts us down in this world till we refine our neshamas. Okay, but anyway, this is general. Now let's prove it, not from my words, prove it exactly from the Torah, the Gemara, the Zohar, where do we see? Specific mentions, of life after death. Okay, so the Gemara says that there's nothing in this world that could pay for a mitzvah, and there's nothing in this world that can reward a mitzvah. So why are we doing the mitzvahs? The neshama is sent down here in this world to purify itself. Why to purify itself? To get closer to Hashem. The entire ball game is getting closer to Hashem. We get closer to Hashem in this world, the next world, Hashem does the neshama a favor. It's a very painful soul correction because this is the world furthest away from Hashem. All the worlds in the spiritual realm, they all know about Hashem. Even in Gehenim, purgatory is on a higher spiritual level than the material world because in purgatory, all the neshamas, they know the truth. They know the truth. Okay, so if we look at the Torah, all the mitzvahs, it's all for purifying the neshama so the neshama can get a higher place in the next world. That's what it's all about. Okay, all of Torah, all of Torah is based on life after death. The entire purpose, the entire purpose of the mitzvah, we say we're not doing Hashem a favor. Nobody is doing Hashem a favor by keeping Shabbat, okay? Nobody is doing Hashem a favor by uh, putting on tefillin, okay? Nobody is doing Hashem a favor by getting on a plane from Chicago and coming to learn Torah in Eretz Yisrael. They're doing it because they're going to be spiritually healthy. They want to get close to Hashem. Bo Hashem. Okay, we do everything we do in order to get close to Hashem. Why? This is the whole thing to bring us in. When, when do we feel the proximity of Hashem? Once the soul leaves the body, and then it gets 
first thing it does, it goes and glues itself to Hashem. And it can't wait for that. It can't wait for that. If a person knew what happens after death, he would look forward to it. Now we can understand the, the Gomorrah and Brochus when Rabbi Akiva is being, his flesh is being raked on the stake. The Romans are raking his flesh, they're killing him. And his students are, have to look at this. See the Rebbe being tortured in the most unspeakable way, something we talk about during the three weeks on Tisha B'Av, something we, we see in Keynote on Tisha B'Av, and Lamentations on Tisha B'Av. And the students yell out, and then Rabbi Kiva says, no, he's got a smile on his face. He says, I waited my whole life for this. I waited my whole life for this. He knows because Rabbi Akiva is looking at the ultimate purpose of life. He's not looking at life, he's looking at life as a whole, not life in this world and life in the next world. In other words, as soon as, let's take one simple mitzvah like loving your neighbor as yourself. As soon as you yell at another human being, or disrespect your parents, even worse, and even worse to raise a hand, do harm to another human being, you don't see life. You don't see life because a person that makes a transgression of Torah, whether he's transgressing loving his neighbor by himself, or whether he's taking something that he doesn't deserve, what's called gezel, it's embezzling something, or he's taking, stealing something, he's murdering his own neshama. You know, what do they call it in football? It's a safety in his own end zone, a fumble in his own end zone. He's losing. You think you're gaining? You're losing. Stop and think what you're doing to the Yashama before you yell at another human being. You have to stop and think. This is the whole purpose of the mitzvahs. It's for us to refine ourselves. The Torah says like this. We count the mitzvahs in the Torah. We come out to 613. And we have the 365 negative mitzvahs that correspond to the tendons of the body. And we have the 248 positive mitzvahs that correspond to the limbs of the body. Why would this come out exactly, 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 exact number that correspond between the limbs and tens of the body, the parts of the body, and the mitzvot? Because every mitzvah we see in every part of the body corresponds to a part of the neshama. There is that, why did we say God, we, God created man in his own image, in Bereshit? When we look at the Rambam, and our third principle of Emuna is that Hashem doesn't have any corporeal qualities. So how can the Torah say that a man is created in Hashem's image when Hashem has no physical qualities? Because we're talking about spiritual man, not physical man, the neshama. The neshama has, it's that we say sons and daughters. Hashem is avinu b'shamayim. He's a father in heaven. We're all sons and daughters of Hashem because we have the same DNA as the father because the neshama is part of Hashem, part of godliness. So we have a body. Our whole bodies are nothing but metaphors. That every part of the body corresponds to a neshama. Every mitzvah of the 613 we do gives vitality to another part of the body. And this is why faith healers, uh, people go to people go to Rav Shalom, and they have a problem with a certain part of a body. So Rav Shalom looks at them, and he probably say, you know, you've done this wrong or done that wrong. Uh, and he could see, and it's he's always right. He's always right because this is the way that people have understanding, they have a deep understanding of what the sham is, what the body is. You can see. So the whole Torah is geared at the neshama, the difference between the neshama and the body. The body is finite because the body is part of matter. It's finite matter. The neshama is infinite because it's a tiny part of Hashem. So now that we know there's life after death, where are you going to make your investment? You have to be a good investor in life. Not only people that deal in Wall Street, they have a good investment. What am I going to do? Am I going to invest in my body or am I going to invest in my neshama? Ah, uh, I will invest in my body insofar that my body is the housing of the neshama. They have to keep a healthy body. Yeah, go exercise and eat naturally, eat great. Take care and be in good shape. Okay, and walk or run, whatever you do. You can take your hour of people to do it. And a lot of people do it while they're jogging or do what they want to, you know. They put on their earphones. People think they're listening to music. No, they're listening to Hashem. 
the talk to Hashem. Okay, no problem. You don't have to think when you're jogging. You can think about Hashem. You don't have to think when you're walking. And what you do, you take an hour a day and you walk and your body's in great shape and your neshama's in great shape. Okay, you put on your, your Nikes and your, your track suit and everybody thinks, oh, he's out walking. You know, you have people feel weird, they're embarrassed. I don't know why people are embarrassed about talking to Hashem. They say, you have to be embarrassed about not talking to Hashem. Say, if a person doesn't do cheshbon nefesh, doesn't do tshuv every day, then in the next world he's going to be really embarrassed. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Binder, it teaches, Zechat Salak Levrocha, Rav Shalom, he, he's the, with the continue, the flame of Breslev after the Holocaust. He brought Breslev to Eretz Yisrael, the Torah of Breslev. Rav Shalom, personally, was his understudy. Rav Shalom heard a lot of things directly from Rav Levi Yitzchak. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak said that every day in a person's life is like a page in a book. He's paraphrasing King David, Psalm 45, Megillah Sefer, Ketuv So when a person goes up after the world into the heavenly court and he gets raked with a fine tooth comb, they go over that book, every little letter, every little syllable, what a person, not only what he did, what he said, what he thought. A person is judged for his thoughts had good thoughts of a person, for example, harbors heretical thoughts. He needs to do tshuva. He needs to dunk in a mitzvah. He needs to strengthen himself in a moon. He needs to get the negative thoughts out of his fast. Because uh, there's some thoughts the Gemara tells us. For example, if a person thinks about forbidden things, well, members of the opposite sex, it's, it's a tantamount, even worse than doing actual deeds. It's terrible. So you have to do tshuva for that. A person is judged for every thought. But Rabbi Lev Yitzchak teaches us that a day that a person does cheshbon nefesh, that he does self-assessment and does tshuva, that page, they take it and they turn that page. No, he's not judged for that page because he judged himself. This is Hashem's compassion. On a day where you judge yourself, you're not judged upstairs. That's why people that talk to Hashem every day and they do cheshbon nefesh, they judge themselves, they save themselves so much aggravation in life because they're not judged. What are our difficulties in life? Our difficulties in life are what's called dinim, stir judgments from Shemaim. Why do people get dinim? They get them to wake them up. But if they would have judged themselves and done tshuva, then they wouldn't have difficult in lives. The reason that people have problem in life because they don't do chesh nefesh. And so Hashem stimulates us. Oh, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for you to come in Yom Kippur and you don't remember what you did on the fourth or fifth of Tevet. You're not going to remember. So you have to do chesh nefesh, you have to do self-assessment every single day. So we see our whole Torah, tshuva, everything, it's geared for the next world. And that's where it is. And now let's go with more specific proofs. More specific proof. Take the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. Sanctification Hashem, one of the biggest mitzvahs in the Torah. What is the purpose of Avram Avinu, Abraham our forefather, jumping in a fiery furnace to prove that there's one God. Nimrod threw him in a fire furnace, he willingly jumped in. Okay, this is Kedush Hashem. He says, I'm sanctifying myself in Hashem's name. What's the purpose of all the people at the Holocaust, they went to gas shepherds, they said, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekeno Hashem Echad. What's the purpose of Kedush Hashem? And we know that a person that dies on Kedush Hashem, any Jew, that died because he was Jew and because of his emunah, he's called a martyr. He's a kadosh. Why is he kadosh? Because he did kiddush Hashem. He's a martyr. He's, he's a holy soul. He goes to the highest place in Gan Eden. So wait a second. What's the purpose of being a martyr if there's no Gan Eden? What's the purpose of being a martyr if there's no life after death? Uh, Avram Avinu was probably the greatest intellect that ever lived. Avram Avinu discovered Hashem when he was three years old through his own power of reason. He had such cogent powers of reason. So he's the, 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 the forefather of the Jewish people. Avram Avinu, he gave his life at Kiddush Hashem. Hashem saved him. Why? Because he did not expect to come out of that fiery furnace. Yitzchak Avinu gave his life at Kiddush Hashem. Yitzchak Avinu held out his neck to his father, and in the Akeda, he said to his father, he said, Abba, shecht with a steady hand. That I, it, it, it shouldn't be an unkosher shechita. Do it, do it properly, Ab. Okay, he was willing. Yitzchak Avinu, the same thing. Why was he saved? Because he did it all the way. From our forefathers down to this very day, 
33,000 Jews in Uman that were not Avram and Yitzchak. Simple Jews, many of them could barely read and write. Rather than bowing down to a cross, they gave their lives. They killed husbands in front of wives and wives in front of children and children in front of parents. Is that the Ginti? This is where was that in Uman in Ukraine? Rabbi Nachman is buried. That's why Rabbi Nachman wanted to be buried there. The whole mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. Why are Jews willing to give the most important thing in life is life itself? Give their life for Kiddush Hashem because of our emuna in the world to come. The eleventh principle of the Rambam that every Jew believes in, just like the first principle, the second principle, all the way down to the 13th principle. That's the first thing, Kiddush Hashlem, a Kiddush Hashem, what we all believe. Uh, how does Avigail bless King David? Avigail meets King David in the Judean desert, and she blesses King David. And she says, nishmas chayim. This is an expression we put on the, on the grave site. She said, my master's soul should be unbound in the land of the living. We write this in the initials on the, on the grave site. You see, Taf, Nun, Tzadik, Beit, Hey, that's the initials of Avigail's blessing to King David. That's where it comes from. Okay. What she mean that my master's soul, she turned to King David, should be bound to the land of the living. King David says, oh, look, I got 120 over 80. I got a pulse of 70, I'm living. What did Ivy Gael mean, who later became King David's wife? What did she mean when she said land and living? This is not called land and living. Rabbi Nachman says, we believe in a world to come. But he says, I can promise you there's no this world. This world is an illusion. That's what Rabbeinu tells us. And look what they are on. So when we talk about the land of the living, we're talking about the next world, because that's the land of eternal life. That's an eternal life. What's the next thing? King David says in Tehillim, he says in Psalm 16, He says, Hashem, I shall walk before you in the land of the living. Well, King David was in Bethlehem. He was in Judea. What, there aren't people alive there? People with pulse? People with uh, blood pressure? What did King David mean? He meant the same thing. I think the land of the living is the land of the eternal living. That's what King David says, etalech, future tense. Not a mitalech, I'm not walking, I shall walk. I look forward to the time when I will be in the land of the living. One of the tremendous proofs in the Torah and our mitzvahs about life after death is one of the punishments. There's a very severe punishment in Judaism. It's called karet. Karet is severance. It's when the neshama is severed from Hashem, heaven forbid. How can that happen? Karet, it's like karet. When someone loses an amputation, in Hebrew it's called a krita. It's from the word karet. It's a severance. Neshama is cut off. Neshama is a part of Hashem. So what happens? There are certain transgressions, certain transgressions in Torah that are punishable by karet, severance, and they're serious punishments. A few examples. If a person willfully eats, willfully, eats chometz on Pesach, that's karet. A person willfully eats on Yom Kippur. Say, hey, don't you know it's Yom Kippur? Yeah, no, it's Yom Kippur. And eats anyway, that's karet. If a person willfully transgresses the Shabbat, that's karet. If a person, you know, all these people are talking about the gay marriage, a person commits sodomy, that is karet. One act, that cuts himself completely off of Shem. If a person consists any type of incest, karet. These are examples in the Torah of karet. What is karet? If we can imagine that all the neshamas, when we sing, we take the Eitzachayim, according to Kabbalah, Eitzachayim, the tree of life, it's the tree of all the neshamas. And the root of all life, that's Hashem. So everything is like one big tree and it's connected to Hashem. The twigs are connected to the branches, the branches are connected to the trunk, the trunk is connected to the source, the root. So when a neshama transgresses 
And does karet, something liable karet, another example, a, a breach in family purity, a willful breach in family purity, that's also karet. Okay, serious things. The neshama is cut off from Hashem. So what happens when the neshama is cut off from Hashem? The Gemara says the neshama comes, cuts, cuts off from Hashem, then it becomes dust at the feet of the tzaddikim in the next world. We don't understand exactly what that means, that's a metaphor, but this is what happened. Everything that a person does in this world, it's like a message. We say it's like a text message to the next world. Everything a person does, imagine that your soul in the upper world has a bank account. And it's got a list, exact accounting of debits and credits. Everything you do good, ah, that's more money in the bank. Another thing, more money in the bank. Another prayer, more money in the bank. Another page of Torah, more money in the bank. You had called, uh, called your parents and said hello, respected them, more money in the bank. Every person things does detrimental, that's a withdrawal. That's a withdrawal. And the end, add the balance sheet. And we are held accountable for every little thing. So no matter where we look in Torah, no matter where we look in the Gemara, no matter where we look in the Zohar, no matter where we look in Arizal, especially in Arizal, in Kabbalah, it's all the next world, all the next world, because the next world is the real world. So there is very definitely life after death. And we know about life after death, not only we're we not scared about death, we are now motivated to live our lives the very best. When does a person does not have motivation to live his life is when he lacks emuna. He thinks that what he does is no consequence. What you do is not only consequence, but it's a consequence not only to you, it's a consequence to your loved ones, to the community you live in, and to all of Klal Yisrael. When one Jew, and this is the Gemara in Sanhedrin, one Jew does a good deed, it could tip the scales and bring the whole world for the for judge. We have to understand that everything we do, it could be that the entire scales of the world, Hashem wants to bring Mashiach right now, if I do this one more good deed, boom, it's going to tip the scales. And if some does the opposite, the other thing, it goes the exact opposite. So that's the first question. It's really anywhere we look at Torah, it's a no-brainer. There's so much more proof. We could give five lessons on this. But we'll go on to our next question. What about the near-death experience? The near-death experience, you go and you're a Japanese person talking about near-death experience. You go and you're an Eskimo. Eskimo had an avalanche of snow, was buried under snow. Miraculously, they found him, but he was frozen for 48 hours and dead and came back to life. And Eskimo describes what he saw when he wasn't there, before he was revived. Okay, here's somebody you see the same exact story from Bolivia. From a Bolivia, from a Peruvian. Person had in the ear, and you go back to, to Denver, Colorado, and a person had a head-on collision and a clinical death, and tells the same exact story. He says, is near-death experience? Oh, the Jews that have near-death experience. When we see, there are Jews that made chuv after near-death experience, one thing after an NDE, after near-death experience, and there's someone all talk about, you cannot stay the same. Anyone with half a brain can't be apathetic after what they see. So what do people see? They describe in the near-death experience, they describe about their spiritual entity hovering over the body, and it sees everything. The guy in Denver, Colorado, smashed in a head-on car. The guy's clinically dead, clinically dead. And they take him, they're, they're trying to revive him, and he knows exactly who the medics were, the paramedics that worked on him, and he knows exactly who the doctor and the nurse were in the emergency room that handled him, that wheeled him into the surgery, and what the surgeon, he could tell what the surgeons were talking about when they were doing surgery on him. How could he know? The guy was out of it. He had no consciousness. He was in the next world. But the Nisham was hovers over the body. He comes back and says all these things. There are no things that no way in the world he could know. That's the first thing. And describe that the physical pain no longer leaving them. And feeling this feeling of, of, of joy, first a little bit of bewilderment, then feeling of happiness, and then they go into the tunnel. People talk about the tunnel, and then they talk about the white light. Just to describe it, you get chills. Not a single thing that people that never, people not Jewish, that never learned a day of Torah in their lives, a word of Torah in their lives, it's described exactly in the Torah. It's exactly in the Gemara, exactly what they talk about. But it says, everyone ever come back? Oh, yeah. 
Sure. We have examples right in the Gemara. If we open up the Gemara to Psachim 58, we open up the Gemara to tractate Psachim 58, we have the story of Rab, Rabbi Yosef. Rabbi Yosef was the son of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi was one of the big tzaddikim in the first generation of Morim, the last generation of Tanim. First, Rav Yosef was his son. Rav Yosef had a clinical death. Rav Yosef was not in this world for 72 hours. And he came back, and his father asked, well, what's going on in the next world? And this is the Gemara. This Gemara is mentioned not only in, in Pesachim 58, it's mentioned in uh, Baba Bas on page 10. I forgot page on the first side or the second side, but it's in Baba Bas on page 10. I think it's 10 8. Yeah, 10 8. So he says, My son, what, what did you see up there? And he said to his father, I saw an opposite world. I said, The people down here that are disdained in the physical world, they have a very important place in the spiritual world. And the people that are respected, they go, people to look up to, they're nothing in the next world. So sometimes you don't, you know, Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach used to tell about a lot of stories about uh, the, the sim simple Jews that were great hidden tzaddikim. You, know, you have to look at every other Jew and you know, maybe be a hidden tzaddikim. There's no such thing as a simple Jew. We see this right here. If we open up the Zohar, there's an unbelievable story in the Zohar. And the story of the Zohar is Rabbi Yossi of Pekian. Rabbi Yossi of Pekian, he was one of the Talmudim Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Yossi of Pekian lost his wife and he had two little kids. Rabbi Yossi of Pekian, he died suddenly. And his classmates, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's son, Rabbi Lazar, and Rabbi Abba, who was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's scribe, he wrote down Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, really Rabbi Abba, he wrote down the Zohar. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai didn't write it himself, physically write it. Rabbi Abba wrote it down, just like Rabbi Natan wrote down Rabbi Nachman's Torah. Every gen, the big tzaddik and that, that scribe wrote it down. So Rabbi Abba and Rabbi Lazar, they were walking in the way, they were going on the way to Pekin, they were gonna go visit Rabbi Yossi. As a, and a big black crow came and started squawking. If you ever hear a, a spell it there, it's Yisrael crow. They know how to squawk. And they squawk and he was really squawking and, he, and they, they could understand, they could understand language. That, they said something bad is happening, has happened to uh, Rabbi Yossi of Pekin. And they got to the town and they saw that Rabbi Yossi is lying on his deathbed, he's lifeless. And he sees two little kids, his one little son, maybe his son was four or five years old, and his son was screaming out to Hashem. His son was screaming out to Hashem. He says, Hashem, little boy, four and a half, five years old, knew all the Torah. He says, Hashem, it says in your Torah that you're not supposed to take the mother away from the goslings. That you take away the goslings and let the mother go free. Hashem, we already lost our mother. Now you're taking our father? Take us instead. And they cried, and they cried, and cried. As soon as they said, take us, and said, Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Abba, they have the, the, the Talmudim Rabbi Shem Yochai, they had Ruach HaKodesh, they had the Holy Spirit, they shuddered. And Rabbi Lazar says to Rabbi Abba, he says, all of heaven is shuddered. As soon as heaven shuddered, Rabbi Yossi came back to life after 72 hours. He came back into life by virtue of his little five-year-old son's prayers. So they came back and they, they talked to Rabbi Yossi of Pekin, what did he see? He describes in the Zohar exactly to Rabbi Abba and Rabbi Lazar, exactly what he sees. Exactly what he sees, the same thing as the near-death experience. We have this, the near-death experience, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai knew about this 1,900 years ago. This is nothing new. So it is the real deal. It is the real deal. And we here, we could go one to one detail. We don't have time to go into individual details. Our time is running out. But one detail after another. I want to address our third question. We talked about is there life after death? Is the near-death experience a real deal? Yes, yes, both yes. Okay, what awaits the neshama? What awaits the neshama? If we open up the Zohar to Parshas Vayechi, the Zohar describes 
because in Vayechi, that's when, in Parshas Vayechi, they're going to be reading next week, the scribes that uh, when Yaakov goes into the next world, Yaakov Avinu, our forefather Yaakov, he leaves the physical world, and the Zohar, at that place, the Zohar describes what happens when the soul leaves the physical world. Okay, if you learn in Hebrew, anyway, you want to see all this in detail, read Gesher Chaim. I don't know if it's ever been translated. You know if Gesher Chaim has ever been translated? I don't think so. I've never heard the, the, the bridge of life. It'd be something for it to be translated. And that's a good project for somebody to take upon. Okay, but the, the Gesher Chaim talks about exactly, there's some good things to look forward to. First of all, if you can imagine the most sublime pleasure in the world, imagine a thing that makes you happiest in this world. What makes you happiest in the world? Um, your biggest, your biggest joy, your biggest dream. Your biggest joy or your biggest dream in this world, it is not one iota of an iota of the pleasure that the neshama has as soon as it leaves the body. Now, it's either a pleasure or an embarrassment. Why? For a tzaddik, for someone that's been righteous, it is a great pleasure. Because the righteous person, he's been working on himself. And, you know, we know our rights for life is not easy. It's full of tests of amunah from morning until night. It's full of tests of until the day we get out of here. But then, when it gets its first exposure to divine light, which it does almost immediately, because as soon as the neshama is no longer incarcerated in the body, it runs right to Hashem. It goes and sticks right to Hashem. Just like the body goes back to its source, the neshama goes to its source. And we know this in physics. In Hebrew, it's called chok shimur energia. In English, it's called the law of preservation of matter. Something learned in physics. Matter does not disappear. The world was created with a certain amount of matter. Matter just gets recycled. Matter is recycled. Matter doesn't disappear. Okay, if you have a, a, a molecule of nitrogen and a molecule of phosphorus, there are the same number of molecules of nitrogen and phosphorus in this world. They're not increased. They're just recycled in different ways. Same amount of moisture in this world. We know the cloud cycle, the rain cycle. It goes in the sea. All the rivers go to the sea. The same thing. The same with the neshama. So we know the body goes back to its source. Just as the body goes back to its source, the soul goes back to its source, goes right to Hashem. So the good news is for the people that did Hashem's will and they paid their dues. Now, wow, they see how much it's worth it. Now, how about the people, eh, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in this. I don't need this. Wow, but they get to see, they get the same pleasure. They get exposed to the same pleasure of divine light. So what do these guys deserve it for? No, because listen, now Hashem shows you who you revolted against all your life. Okay, that is really embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. And we see in this week's Torah portion, when Yosef reveals himself to the brothers, I am Yosef, your brother. The Midrash tells us that their souls flew, their souls almost flew away. The angels to go and shtup their souls back into the body. Can you imagine when the soul leaves the body and the divine light, that loving, white, caressing light that everybody talks about in the near-death experience, and it reveals itself to a person, and it says two words, Ani Hashem. Why, 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 why? <laughs> and it's so loving. Can't even begin to describe it. Can't even describe it. So everybody gets a dose of this. The tzaddikim, oh, they bask in it, and the rishayim, it's a, it, that's, where, that's where their purgatory starts and the embarrassment of who they revolt against. Another thing you can look forward to when you leave. You get to see, you know, who greets you when your neshama goes? The souls of your grandparents, your great-grandparents. If you're righteous, the souls of the tzaddikim, they come. And if you did good in this world, oh, they're so proud of you. And if not, it's such an embarrassment. <laughs> the great parents. Look, look who they brought into the world. All these special things, it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. It's a very good stuff when we do Hashem's will. We strengthen ourselves in the Muna and do our very best to learn Torah and keep the mitzvahs. It's not doing Hashem a favor, it's doing ourselves a favor. And that everyone, we should all deserve what Avigal said to King David, a portion in the land of living 
תהיה נשמתם, נשמתנו, צורה בצור החיים. For every single one of us, we should strengthen ourselves in אמונה, so we have a chance to look forward, not only to a world of eternal bliss, but השם should soon bring us משיח צדקנו, build our holy temple, and gather in the exiles, and have a taste of the bliss right here in rebuilt Eretz Yisrael, speed in our days, amen. Thank you.